All right, good afternoon. Welcome back. Go ahead and grab a seat. We're going to go ahead and get started in just a couple moments. We're going to talk about what I think is honestly one of my favorite topics, and I, I think I'm in a safe space when I can say that points out just how much of a geek I am. But, uh, but digital policy. So digital policy, we've talked about and talk about like, policy. In fact, right now, on the other, uh, other side of the country, our, our, our fantastic uh, congressional leaders are, are debating really important policy right now about how to keep the, uh, the government funded. I mean, uh, just a simple task. But we don't talk about digital policy very much. So this is a great opportunity to bring a, a, a panel with a wealth of uh, knowledge and experience on, uh, on many different topics, but in particular, um, digital policy, and dive into this about how it relates to MDS and CDS. Because far too often, we think about the mobility data specification as a one-way path of companies providing data to cities. But perhaps more importantly, but oftentimes less talked about, is the opportunity for cities to send policy back to mobility operators and those very uh, um, companies that are operating these services on their streets in a digital and a machine-readable way. So we're going to take the next little while to, to talk about that. And first, I'm going to introduce a really good friend of mine and former OMF board member, uh, Connie Janos, who's going to come on out here and uh, introduce the rest of the panel and moderate this session for us. So thanks. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Wow, these lights. I would say I see some faces, though, some familiar faces. Um, all right, and yeah, panelists, let's all sit down and we can get going here. Um, hopefully everyone had a nice lunch and we will wake you up here with this uh, scintillating panel. Um, so mobility data specification, um, curb data specification, uh, two incredibly important tools um, as Andrew pointed out, uh, they really allow cities and the growing ecosystem of uh, mobility uh, providers uh, to be able to communicate in really different ways. And today, uh, in almost 2024, uh, we sort of can just speak uh, even to the acronyms, right? It's sort of common uh, knowledge for the most part. Um, but I think... Uh, to, it really is important to sort of think about how far we've come in five years. And so we'll do a little bit of, of speaking to, to that. Um, what, are, what are some of the things that have us the most excited about where we are with this work? Uh, and, and what are some of the ongoing tension points to really have um, not only the tools, but the solutions we're trying to provide um, really emerge um, from the use of this technology. But before we go there, uh, I definitely want to introduce uh, these amazing panelists. So I'm going to start off um, with uh, going from, from this direction, Carlos Cruz Casas, uh, who's a Chief Innovation Officer at Miami-Dade County Department of Transportation and Public Works. His primary focus is on introducing mobility, innovations, and a plan for fully integrated transportation system. He's got experience in both the public and private sectors, ranging from conceptual design to the implementation of really multimodal transportation, pedestrian, bicycle, transit, and traffic. He also serves as a board member and a founding board member of the Open Mobility Foundation. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, sitting right next to me here is Jarvis Murray. Uh, Jarvis, since 2016, has served as the four higher policy and inform enforcement administrator for the city of Los Angeles. I like to, to call him the regulator. <laughs> um, uh, so under his umbrella, he regulates taxi cabs, medical transportation, and shuttles, as well as dockless scooters, delivery robots, um, and any number of other private vehicle modes that are currently and yet to be um, sort of integrated into the regulatory scheme of the city. As part of his role, he is tasked with directing policy uh, for these industries, working with stakeholders to develop partnerships, improve tech, and manage the regulatory environment. Um, Ariel Fleischer, transportation strategist, uh, and a uh, long time, um, uh, both public and private sector. Uh, you've got a unique combination of public health, 
uh, design and planning her current role. She is the policy development and research manager at Waymo, where she develops policies on the transportation issues that matter to cities, such as congestion, transit integration, equity, and data sharing. This role builds on her previous experience um, and a number of, of really key uh, agencies, including SPUR and SFMTA in the Bay Area. And uh, last but certainly not least, Liza Josias, who leads the ecosystem development and stakeholder engagement at EVE Air Mobility. She is collaborating with government, industry, and communities to develop this ecosystem uh, needed for safe, accessible, and sustainable urban flight. Uh, an experienced industrial designer and human factors engineer with decades of experience in enhancing the safety of air traffic operations um, and who's also been a key a developer of a couple of important tools, including uh, EVE's urban air traffic management concept and numerous uh, urban air mobility concepts of operations. Thank you all uh, for being here today. Um, so why don't we just jump right in? Uh, and I, I thought uh, maybe to kick us off here, uh, I would really um, love the opportunity for our panelists to talk a little bit about how the development of uh, the mobility data spec in particular, uh, how did that change uh, a lot of your thinking around the day-to-day -day work streams that you manage in your respective fields? Um, you've all got some very unique and different perspectives um, and you're, you're sort of thinking about digital policy and these tools in a very specific way. Um, Carlos, why don't we start with you? Do you hear me now? Yeah. Excellent. So, um, you know, being here from the beginning, right, and I think mobility data specification has been, you know, a work in progress over the last kind of almost five years actually showing the potential, right? We've talked about data and, and, and one thing I'll mention, you start realizing how much time you're spending with your friends and peers when you start speaking the same language. So Andrew and I, we talked about uh, machine readable. We're talking about you know being able to deliver policies. And, and I say that because we started with MDS thinking that not only we get to understand what's the mobility options that are available out there and how do they behave in the public right away, but for them to understand what are the rules of engagement. We talked about that basic component on how to use the space, right? You know, and we don't need to teach a, an autonomous vehicle or a scooter or a bike how to read a static sign, but actually deliver that in a language that they can understand through APIs. So I think we've seen that over the course of the years. Now what have changed for me, uh, Connie, is the fact that, you know, first we're thinking about how we can do what we do today better through a digitized manner, right, in a different fashion. To me now it's an opportunity to start kind of managing the streets based on the context that they have and based on the particular mobility option that's coming in. Mobility options are coming in in all shapes and sizes. And the question that begs to, uh, to be asked is, you know, do all of them need to use the public right away the same way? Right? Today we have a static sign that says 30 miles an hour, a, a car, a, a electric car, a truck, a van, all of them have to abide by the same rule. Now we have the opportunity to think about that is the mode agnostic, the right approach, or start looking how our street can become safer by having more mode specific rules. And on top of that, we start seeing different shapes and sizes. You know, travel lane, bike lane, and sidewalk should be kind of considered in a different way. So now for me, I'm looking at into, can I create a specific rules for each one of the modes over time of day, specific to the lane and the space they're taking on the public right away? It's a complete kind of change in our role, right? We are here, you know, we manage traffic signals, highways, uh, traffic control devices, bridges, you know, bicycle pedestrian stop, uh, transit planning, transit operation. So think about it as mobility management, and that comes to the basic element of basically managing the demand on the public right away that meets the context of the space and the community next to it. So to me, I've seen MDS to just at initial to bring new mobility solutions to work together with cities in a good manageable way to now unlocking the potential to manage the space like we meant to be, to be more con uh, sensitive to the context next by. That's great, maybe I'll uh, punt it to you, Jarvis, and maybe you can uh, walk us through some of the specific projects or pilots that you think really can help illustrate and demonstrate for folks uh, the value adds uh, that we can bring through this digital policy work. Um, you know, how, how does it facilitate some of the goals uh, that maybe the 
you know, from the public sector context, the public policy goals you have it, within the current uh, dynamic transportation industry that you're also regulating within. Mike? Thank you. So uh, I think one of the things, or let me back up. I'll talk through some of the things that we see uh, as we work with MDS right now. And um, even right now, one of our one of our early things that we were recently learning, because again, we've been doing this for a little while, but now we're getting an opportunity to really kind of reflect and go in and see how we can you know, improve things. So something that has recently come up for us, and again, this is because of the data, you know, with our robot delivery companies. Um, you know, they were able to show us, we were able to see through the data, these are the areas that we don't go to. And it wasn't so much about going to them, but it was because the, the sidewalk, which they travel on, had no curb cut. And so they have to reroute around that area to avoid that co the curb cut. And so when we're looking at it, we're like, well, if our robots can do it, neither can anyone who uses a wheelchair. And it was one of those things where they, we were able to see various intersections that, oh, no one, you can't get through this if you have a wheelchair, um, unless you leave early in the driveway or something like that. So, you know, having, seeing that data and being able to have it has been instrumental for us to take a look and go, we need to tell somebody, you know, we, you know, we can forward that information to, you know, street services and, you know, or whatnot. And they can take a look at that, but it was something that we would not have noticed otherwise because we're so huge. We have thousands of miles of sidewalk and street. And so, you know, what MDS allows you to do is you don't have to send someone out to just map everything. You, you need so many people to try to map the entire streets. And by the time you're done mapping, you have to restart over because something has probably changed on the other end that you started already. So. It's really been good for us to allow us to work in those ways and to be able to scale, um, you know, work with companies at a large scale. Because again, we have over 20,000 and for a time we had over 30,000 scooters on the right of way. And it was much easier for us to work through MDS to push policy and to push development rather than having to, hey, you know, call one company, call the next company. Did you do this? Are you sure? Can you check? You know, we were able to do it all at once. And so, you know, we've been able to do a lot of those things. And even and even if we make mistakes, one of the great things about MDS is that, you know, it's not so much you make mistakes, but like, and I mentioned this, I was on the, the previous panel where we, we developed uh, parking zones downtown. Um, and most of it was to help relieve clutter in the area. We had a lot of complaints from the businesses, the neighbors, the council offices about the clutter um, of scooters on their right of way. So we developed parking zones for the scooters on the right of way, um, which cleaned it up a lot. It was a lot less cluttered, but it hurt ridership. And so we had to really partner with the companies to go over this, you know, what do you need ridership wise? And, you know, the challenge was, you know, the business improvement districts, you know, they're not huge fans. So we had to kind of take it and massage it for them to be able to add more spaces. So we're gonna add more spaces for them because we want we want that ridership. We have a lot of ridership, people who are relying on it. And because it's downtown, it's not just tourists. It's a lot of people who are using it for commuter reasons. And so, but that was the kind of thing that we were able to, to do because even as we set that policy and it alleviated one issue, it created another and we were able to change it really quickly. So that's the beauty of it. And maybe just for a, a point of privilege too, because it is my favorite story to tell about um, sort of MDS, because I think in particular when we talk about equity and digital policy and new modes um, coming into the space, often equity is sort of billed as a, as a um, benefit of the technology. But frankly, it's a lot harder to really show that in, in sort of proof, right? Uh, deployment, where it's deployed, how do you get to the scale where it's actually meeting those equity goals that you have that increase uh, choice and options for, for folks who need it the most and who have uh, the largest amount of, of options. And I know in Los Angeles, 
Um, and I, I just uh, recently left uh, the Los Angeles Department uh, of Transportation. But in LA, right, there was this ability to, through the tools we originally regulated, to have enforce people deploying in communities that have fewer options, right? Communities of need from an equity perspective. And in the end, you ended up having to manage growth, right? In some of these uh, communities, uh, where it's actually leading to market growth in the private sector, what, what stemmed out of a digital policy that we were enforcing. Maybe, I don't know if you can share any more details on that, but I do think that's a really powerful example. Yeah, just really quickly. So we did, we had set geographic trip fees throughout the area. And we had areas that we wanted to encourage ridership in. And so by de being able to do that, we had a much lower cost of trip fees in those areas. And we had higher trip fees in areas where that was the busiest area and the most cluttered. And but you know, one of the things that did occur was that, you know, the, the companies, again, many of these companies see a lot of things that we don't necessarily see. So on MDS, we really are getting only a small percentage of this data. But, you know, one of the things they were able to see um, was that out in the valley, in the areas that we are trying to do ridership, when they started to deploy, even if it was small in those areas, because it's also a requirement for us, if you're going to deploy in a fancy area, you got to deploy in the area that we care about as well. But they were able to see uh, open and closes on their app. And they said, oh, we have a lot of people opening the app in this area now, and we actually don't have enough scooters to cover it. And so they came and said, hey, we want to request more scooters, and we will only deploy them in that area. But there's clearly, we see that people want to use it in that area. And a lot of that was because we had kind of pushed deployment in that area, and then they were able to see people start using, and then, oh, wow, we need more. And so they added about 1,500 scooters for that area. And, um, and it was a, a good way to, to do that. Thanks for adding that color, uh, Jarvis. I, I, I think it's such a tangible example of, of what is possible. And I think for, for those of us who sort of saw the, the inception of the tool and its development, I think it really was born. I mean, when I think about, Carlos, what you were saying, this desire um, for the public sector to be able to say yes to innovation within the confines of the, of the responsibilities that public sector agencies have uh, to make sure that the public right of way it's, is being held to its best use and it's meeting the needs of, of our most vulnerable populations and, and the communities that we serve. I'm curious, um, Ariel and uh, Lisa, um, do, you, uh, do you think that it's meeting that goal, that intended goal from the private sector perspective? If you could add uh, some of your thoughts, that would be great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very excited to be here as part of this conversation. Waymo has been part of, a member of the OMF Foundation for several years now with the goal of <coughs> being at the table, shaping the specs, understanding what is happening. It's a real commitment at the company to wanting to be at the forefront and really part of this conversation. And I love that the purpose of MDS is to get to yes, and CDS is to get to yes, and about how do we embrace and bring new mobility into our cities in a productive way. And at Waymo, again, we're at the table, we're really interested in these conversations, we're committed to learning, we're thinking of innovative ways to, to move this conversation forward. Um, as I've been doing, reflecting and listening to what folks have been saying, in, in my seat, so my job at Waymo is, is to develop policies, it's to get Waymo to think about how are we gonna handle congestion, how are we gonna handle equity, how are we gonna meet, meet data, data sharing expectations. And in some ways, I, I serve this almost intermediary role where I talk to cities, I understand their needs, and I turn back to my colleagues and I say, okay, we can meet this need if we do X. So here's, here's how we can you know, solve for this problem in the city. And <coughs> I think in the MDS CDS place where I have been struggling a little bit is in that, that triangular group, in that storytelling. And someone used the analogy earlier, of like, um, you know, we're dating, right? And I, I think like, maybe we just need a stronger dating profile, which is to say, <laughs> there's been so many good thoughts up here about the flexibility in CDS, right? It didn't work here, we're moving it around, or all these great anecdotes and stories about how it's made a difference in planning for the cities. And I think there's a missing step in getting to yes, is really sharing that story more and sharing it in, in a way that's for a policy audience. So I was mentioning earlier that I spent a lot of time on the MDS CDS GitHub, trying to understand what curb events are and what all these other things mean. And I, again, I think what's missing in the conversation is something that's more digestible for a non-technical audience of 
what this is, how it works, what really matters to city, what are the goals, how is data stored, how is the privacy, here's how it works, here's the difference it made. Some way of really, like I said, a dating profile, your CDS, MDS dating profile that really outlines all these things so we can move to like the next step and go get coffee and figure it out and maybe one day go study <laughs> to take this <laughs> way too far. Um, but that, yeah, that to me, as I've been reflecting and listening is, is at least in my company, we're at the table, we're listening, we're curious, but what's the, this impasse is because there's just not enough understanding of purpose, need, expectations, um, storage, privacy, all of those things. Is that one? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, <laughs> thanks for that. That's been really interesting because um, I, I'm from Eve. We come from a, a future perspective where we're looking to introduce urban electric aircraft into the urban airspace. And when I first heard about MDS, I just thought it was absolute genius. Um, and like any new technology like Waymo, Eve and, and, the, and just the general AAM community, we need to find a happy place where we have the social license, where communities will say yes, where governments will say yes. And I, I think the MDS is incredibly important because it enables these new innovations to understand the lessons learned from the past, um, maybe understand the data from ways where we never really ex thought of it before. And also, it's, it's an avenue through which um, airspace integration, usually when, when it comes to aviation, you, the data is all about between like the FAA and then the aircraft. And I, I think it's an opportunity to really open up our minds and think this is also an opportunity to grab that data, transform it into a meaningful um, narrative for cities um, to know what's going on. Because as urban air mobility starts to become um, closer to reality, um, local governments are going to play an absolutely outsized role. Um, and dealing with aviation is not something that um, local governments and land use policy is used to. <laughs> um, and so I, I think this is a wonderful opportunity to have us think strategically um, before that first aircraft goes up and takes that first passenger and understand what is it that the community rules are going to be, what types of data will um, local governments want to know about, um, when you see a helicopter flying over LA skies, you know, you go, it's LA, right? Um, you'll, you'll see one within five minutes and that's called a visual flight rule. So nobody has to file a flight plan, so nobody knows who's flying and who's going where. Um, but I think with MDS, it enables the industry to potentially give more transparency for cities to feel comfortable so they know what's going on, know who's following the rules, and then um, have that flexibility as time goes on. So if schools or hospitals say, you know, you can fly over on the weekends, but not Monday to Friday, we have that dynamic ability to um, be flexible with those rules and um, um, change up where aircraft go and don't go. So I, I thought it was absolutely a, a fantastic way to get to yes faster through um, communities and local government. Yeah, so I'm, I'm hearing, oh, did you want to chime in, Carlos? No, no, I'm f fascinated about this, right? The first thing I think, Ma Michael, you heard is we need to have a slide, you know, slide right button in the GitHub. That's the first thing. But to your point now is uh, is uh, selecting the restaurant and then looking at the menu and basically identifying what's the path for for that first day, right? So those that's getting to yes, but getting to also kind of identifying the path that both you know, the public sector and the private sector are feel comfortable and uh, are aiming towards a one common goal, right? So just, just wanted to add. Yeah, no, absolutely. Let's see how far we can take the uh, dating. Do we get all the way to, to marriage? Hopefully not to divorce. Um, that would be sad. Um, so I, what I'm hearing, right, I think is on the one end, uh, you're um, flagging, Ariel, that there's still more information that needs to, more information sharing. Um, and I think in the conversation about digital policy, really taking it down to uh, the level of understanding where we can have commonplace conversations about how, how we, we make it work for both parties, right? With the, the end goal I think that everyone has, which is how do you get to more options that make sense. Um, uh, that makes sense for, for residents in a community. Um, I think, uh, Lisa, I find it really exciting to hear you say that, that um, you find it to be powerful, right? And it could change the dynamic and the direction of, of 
your industry, which really has yet to really materialize, right? Um, and, and I think um, one of the things as a follow-up to, to what you were saying, I mean, do you think that the development of tools actually enable a, a faster deployment of some of these emerging technologies um, because you actually have the ability to execute on that digital policy? I mean, is that something that you think about? Or are there still some real tension points? And, and Ariel, please jump in, um, that really sort of um, prevent that. So, so when it comes to advanced aviation, um, there, there, there's a lot of um, excitement about the technology, which is understandable. But th the biggest uh, barriers are going to be community education. And I don't mean that in a condescending way, like informing the communities what it is and having them understand how it's going to impact them. But I think um, the MDS is not going to be a magic bullet, but it'll be a way of um, providing object objective data that, that shows what's going on. I think someone else said earlier that, you know, it's very hard to win the hearts and minds by just saying, trust me. It, it's much more meaningful when there's actually objective data behind it. And I think MDS, um, taken to three dimensions is going to be a potential opportunity for um, having that you know, neutral ground, understanding what's going on, and also for the um, AEM industry to understand from cities what is it that's more than what the types of data the MDS currently captures, what else do you want it to capture, so that we can all be on the same page and have an understanding of what that shared expectation is. So MDS is an incredible, powerful tool. Um, but it's going to be a lot more than that, but it's certainly incredibly helpful to help us move forward. Yeah, um, I would take the challenge to extend the dating analogy. So the way I think about it is, like, you know, in some ways we're, like, really smitten that there is this tool that can help us plan better cities, that can help us with safe and effective curb drop-off, that can enhance safety, that can help us improve our infrastructure, that, they, again, like, we are smitten with the potential <laughs> of this tool. But then you get to the details and you're like, well, do we want to live in the same place? Do we both want kids? Like, how late do you stay up, right? Do you do your dishes after? There's all these like little details. See, I told you I could do this. <laughs> There's all these little details that I think, um, but there are answers that need to be almost uh, talked through. And I think that's the point where we're at, at least with my company, that there is definitely, an, uh, again, uh, the promise and potential is really at the forefront and, and exciting, and now there's all these details to understand about well, the data storage, the privacy, the specific use cases, and understanding more about how it has been used and used to success, that whole part of it, where I think is absolutely a place that we can get to, um, but there needs to, I think, be more conversation, more learning, more curiosity, and more understanding. Um, so I'll ask a, a maybe a bit of a, of a, a pushback question. Which is, you know, I think uh, we're speaking a little bit about we need more information on the tool um, to be able to embrace it from a private sector perspective, um, which I think sounds a lot like sometimes uh, the reaction you get from government, right, when you have a new emerging technology uh, showing up, right, and you're, you're concerned about, again, getting to yes in that deployment or figuring out how it's going to make sense. So from a, from a digital policy perspective, from a development perspective, how do we resolve that tension point? Because in some ways, it puts us back to where we start, right? Uh, which is lack of trust <laughs> on both ends um, and a mismatch uh, in our, in our um, mutual, um, you know, long-term goals. Maybe somebody doesn't want to get married. They just want to, you know, uh, be in an open relationship and somebody's looking to, you know, get married within a year. Um, I love this so much. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I really think metaphors are a, a great way to communicate, and I think hopefully folks are understanding. Um, what I will say is something that I think really I think is unique is about Waymo is we have a very thoughtful, deliber th thoughtful, deliberate approach to our scaling, for example, in cities, um, and to how we work with partners. And I so I, I think in terms of overcoming that tension or like. We, we want to be thoughtful, we want to deliver, we are at the table. We are a member of the OMF Foundation. We probably chat with Andrew every other week thinking about how we can move things forward. How, so we're constantly in dialogue and I think that is, that is the best way we're going to keep forward, to have that open and curious attitude. 
to be at the table to learn, to share, to be able to say to Jarvis, like, I really need a greatest hits of CDS and MDS on paper that I can show to my colleagues about how it's worked, why it's been successful. And I think to have these relationships where we can talk about what we need to reach that shared goal, to reach, yeah, to reach that shared goal, I think is really important. So again, I think it is at Waymo, we're very thoughtful, thoughtful and deliberate, focused on focus on the outcome and, and having that open and curious attitude to get there. So there's value in the dating, even if you don't get married. You might end up as long-term friends. Like it, love it. Um, and I think, you know, from the public sector side too, right, and I think because sort of the inception again of this was really about facilitating um, public sector embracement of, of innovation, um, I'm curious about the lessons learned um, for you and your respective roles. Um, you know, I think Carlos and I were talking before coming on stage and, um, you know, some of us still have the scars to prove, right? That the development of the tool was not, not easy. Um, you know, I think some of the questions you're raising, um, Ariel, they're, they're certainly matured in the nature of um, where it's coming from a place of curiosity rather than uh, perhaps just knee-jerk opposition, right, um, to this idea that you would have cities um, engaging in a, in a more direct way um, and, and really wanting to engage in that data sharing relationship. Um, so there's, there's some of those conversations around privacy, around um, what, is the, what are the proper uh, sources of data you should or shouldn't be requesting, how do you store it, just curious how both of you leading um, so many um, use cases um, around these tools. How are you grappling with some of those, uh, those tension points? And do you feel like there's lessons learned uh, now, several years later, um, that you're thinking about as, as we think to, I don't know, the future of an MDS 3.0 or, or a CDS 2.0? Whoever wants to go first. So, so I will start and I'll, and I'll let Jarvis kind of take it through. Uh, so the, we're talking about data policy and, and the underlying uh, basically element that allows for us to talk about this is digital infrastructure, right? It's basically how everything kind of comes together. And one of the big benefits that we've seen is that we're, that we're not alone, right? That we're not alone. The fact that, you know, we, we took what LA developed, right, and basically took it to Miami, right? So again, following on this, you know, is uh, going out and taking my best wingman here in order to make sure that I can address and I can meet my goals. It is what happens with digital infrastructure, with the policies, right? It allows for that learning and basically being able to have the conversation, not only on the table, but everyone is on the table, right? And that support from all the cities across the nation and even beyond can allow for a better understanding and a stronger approach from city's point of view. So, so, so starting from that, I, we started the benefit of learning from all the cities and what you've done and, and leading the charts has been huge, right? And allows for us to start, you know, a couple steps ahead of where we were uh, before, not only having to focus on the immediate kind of small policies, but now uh, looking at Miami Day County and looking at the spaces that we have, which I envy the wide sidewalks that you guys have. I have four feet, five feet of sidewalks. So my policy is going to be different. My policy around um, this where you place a scooter or the device needs to be more tailored to Miami Day County than other places. So I think there is has been with a lot of lessons learned and basically looking at what other cities have done and how to apply that to a local context uh, like Miami as we continue to grow. Yeah, and, and I'll add that, you know, I think an important part of this is communication. Um, and this is a communication with the community as well as with uh, the private sector business. And so, you know, to, to carry that, that dating analogy even further, um, you know, oftentimes your community and your policymakers, they are your friends and family. And they're looking at this person that you're trying to date and they're seeing red flags. But, you know, and all they're looking at, you're saying, but she's beautiful. And they're like, that's not enough. <laughs> but, and then it comes, you don't know her like I do. <laughs> and it's having all the data points to understand exactly what they're doing so that you can go to those, to the community, to your policymakers and say, look, this is how she can make our lives better. But she can't do it without the data. And so that's the important thing to me in terms of how, how we're able to do that because we can help establish public trust. We can help establish the trust with our friends and family. 
if we have the data pieces to help educate them about what the benefits of this can be instead of them just seeing red flags. So that's how I look at it. I love it, right? <laughs> well, what, a, what, a, what a way to uh, take us through that. And I think and when, we, when we think about, for example, uh, you know, what's happening, what happened in the Bay, right, with, with autonomous vehicles, right, and sort of the challenges that we saw up there. I think, I think that maybe, you know, maybe that dating relationship could have been supported if there was more proof points that um, were readily accessible, right, um, to both, both parties, but importantly to the friends and family, right, uh, to really be able to validate here are the places where we do have concern, but here are all the places where we don't, or here's where it's working smoothly, and really the ability to hone in, right, on the places where there is friction. I think oftentimes, right, um, there's uh, synergy in a lot of, of space, um, right, and mutual interest, and then there's these uh, small tension points that, again, very similar to a relationship, if left, uh, without any sort of uh, real digging in, you know, they end up becoming um, I intractable problems. Um, so uh, I think that that's a really interesting uh, way to, to segue. I think we, we are going to try and take uh, some time for questions. So if folks have uh, any questions for our panelists, maybe you can get, uh, get those going. And I, my understanding is that there's someone who can pass around a mic. Uh, before uh, we move over to questions, though, um, maybe some parting thoughts from, from each of you um, as you're thinking about the future of digital policy um, for these tools and, and beyond, right? As we're looking at a transportation system that really uh, is more and more integrated with the types of um, technologically driven um, operations that require digital policy to actually be able to get to the next level. Um, any parting uh, thoughts, wisdoms, uh, questions that, y that you would like to see answered as, again, digital policy is, is advanced? So, um, so going back to Jarvis's point and introducing your partner to your family and the friends, um, I, I think you actually hit the nail on the head, especially when you have new technologies uh, coming in, new innovations that may get the family and friends nervous. Um, establishing legitimacy and trust are, you can't um, overstate the importance of those. And uh, if, you know, there are certain boundaries that the community and local government is willing to set, you know, you can like, I'll, I'll have an attempt at your um, dating analogy. Um, yeah, uh, take your new girlfriend to the beach, fine, but don't, we're not ready for you to bring her to grandma's house. <laughs> right? Um, and so at which point will the family trust you enough to bring them to grandma's house? Um, and, and that might be over the more sensitive parts of your city, like hospitals, schools, parks. Um, so, you know, it, it's baby steps. Um, in aviation, we're look, using the crawl, walk, run approach, and I think we need to sort of keep that same um, approach when we think about how do we gain um, government trust as well as a community trust. Like, let's crawl and demonstrate that we're trustworthy and we can be adults in the room um, rather than these teenagers who want to break things and run. Um, so I, I think MDS is a great way for everyone to you know, put their cards on the table and show what they're really doing and offer that transparency. Anyone else? Uh, and I think really sort of honing in on, I mean, we heard communication, uh, better communication tools as, as something that needs to sort of be integrated as we're thinking about refining uh, the tools and, and the digital policy work. Um, but are there other places, untapped areas, um, where we need to be taking and directing this work towards, right, um, to really get to the desired outcomes? So, so I'll, I'll briefly mention, I know we talked about digital infrastructure, the value they bring, and I think we haven't kind of completely see the potential, right? And I think that's something that we need to push forward. Um, and we need to see it that's the same way that we look at physical infrastructure, allowing for uh, the, our cities do to move our, 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 our ability to actually get things done. 
So, so I think the untapped potential and what I'd love to continue to push forward is, you know, how we can leverage this new way of interacting with the public right of way between public sector and private sector uh, to uh, unlock, unlock potentials, right? You know, we've been doing things in our streets based just purely on a house, a human driver feels behind the, the driving st the steering wheel, right? We design our streets, we just take into consideration all these risk factors. So moving forward, can we then start thinking if we, like, like Jarvis mentioned, right? I think is, you know, looking at the opportunity to understand how we can infer inf information about lack of uh, accessibility from actually looking at modes that are going around and start looking at potential to explore how we manage the space a lot better, right? Today, we're still applying the same static, you know, rules to more digital infrastructure. So how we can get to more dynamic and allow for us to uh, maximize the, the potential. Um, I think, you know, my only parting thought about it is this is still all very new. And in my mind, MDS and the way we're doing it is just the beginning. And I, I, and I hope, you know, especially amongst this audience that we recognize that we're going to iterate and we're going to grow and it may change. We may start, we may start to see things where we decide, you know, theoretically we know what this should look like and then in real practice it looks different and then perhaps we're going to be making changes to that. So I do hope that as we go, we just continue to improve on what we're doing and how we're using it and that we don't fall into um, having it be a static system. And I would just add too that I think the, the promise and potential of MDS and CDS is really exciting. I think the ability to have a more effectively managed right of way, a safe and effective curb for, for pickups and drop offs, and to your point about um, uh, the accessibility, are there things that we can help figure out faster and in real time using this data? There, there, the applications abound and, and they're really exciting. And I think there's a lot of potential to, to thoughtfully get there. I think just acknowledging that this is this is new, this is this is nascent stages. We are we are you know dating, um, getting to know each other, understanding each other's pain points, what what works, what doesn't. And I think that's that's a good thing for all of us to remember in some ways that this is this is really new. We're figuring it out. We have an open and curious attitude. And that to me I think is just the the most important part for having success in these conversations and ultimately the further adoption of the tool. Great. Do we have any questions from the audience? This on? Hi, uh, Michael Schwartz with Ride Report. Uh, thank you, this is a great discussion. Uh, I am curious, maybe starting with the two operators, but then also I would like to hear uh, what, what Jarvis and Carlos have to say. We've been uh, using MDS policy um, as part of our platform, helping cities basically manifest their rules to the operators. And it's kind of caught, it feels like it's caught kind of right in that in-between area where the rules don't change very often, right? A micro-mobility program is, is published, Maybe there's an event, so there's something that, that happens. The rules aren't super complicated. It's sort of go, no go, maybe a low speed zone, maybe certain hours, but nothing nearly as complex as what you two are dealing with in terms of air traffic and, and moving vehicles. Um, so I'm my question is really about, do you ever see a point where you would rely on a public agency or a vendor of a public agency to represent the source of truth of the rules for what you do and you would ingest it kind of in real time um, to be able to update sort of what your vehicles are doing and being able to respond to them. Um, and maybe a follow-up question to, to Jarvis and Carlos, you know, do you all see that as something that, that you want to be able to do? There's, there's a lot of sort of governance issues and how you do change control and all kinds of things to, to deal with there. But I think that's sort of the trajectory we're on is how do we kind of use these digital, this digital rule management to really start to manage the, the right-of-way in, in a much more iterative way. I'll speak from um, an aviation point of view. Um, the, the FAA, first of all, is the body that manages the airspace. Um, so we do see um, a, a digital exchange of data between the FAA, the local city, um, and the fleet operator, as well as the, the vertiport operator. So it's like the, the, the bus stop for aircraft. And so there's going to be a, a lot of real-time um, 
data exchange to facilitate very safe, I mean, safety is always your priority to facilitate safe and efficient movement. So I, I think this is like something where the um, roles and responsibilities need to be addressed. Um, but we do see at least, for example, um, the situation where maybe there's a city fire. So now you've got maybe the um, Los Angeles Fire Department. There's a huge uh, piece of the freeway in the center of the city. Exactly. That you say, can no say the longer freeway is burning, on. right? Say Just hypothetically <laughs> speaking. Well, hypothetically saying, let's say the freeway's burning, and then there's a whole section of the, um, the downtown that's affected by, affected by smoke, and maybe there's a vertiport that's affected. Um, we, we see the need for um, real-time data, so the fire department and the first responders can tell the fleet operator that this section of town, these vertiports are, um, you know, they're going to be closed um, for the next few hours, and then, um, so then there's going to be that MDS that's also going to be sharing that sort of um, uh, very dynamic rule set uh, to, uh, to update everybody so everyone has a accurate situation awareness to, to support um, the decisions. Whenever, whenever I go to my colleagues and I say the city has data on X, they're like, but is it in real time? And that's, there's, there's a thirst, there's a hunger, there's a real desire for real time information, whether that's a street closure because of a block party or cons often construction, um, you know, construction is often, we're gonna be X date to X date, but are they really there in those dates? You don't know because they block it off for many months. So the more that we can have real time updates on what's happening in the city would be, uh, I think, phenomenally helpful for our companies something that we're really interested in. Yeah, yeah, definitely in it. And, and for us, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I, when I'm driving, uh, I, I see, I know the speed limit of when I'm driving more from either my Waze app or the dashboard on my car, right, than actually reading signs. So we're not allowing basically for the rules of engagement to be dictated by someone else when it's supposed to be our responsibility. We've been doing this for decades on end, right? So, so yes, for us, it is critical that we get to that point and we start expressing that in a digital format in real time in order to ensure that everyone has access to it. You know, and we do that today with over 3,000 traffic signals that we manage you know, in real time and we put in traffic you know, patterns on that. And so, so if we can do that for signals, we can do that for segments and we can start working on that information exchange and pushing that uh, forward to have a better understanding and control of the rules that we are tasked to actually deliver. Right, so yes, I think that's the direction that I wanna get to uh, and all we talked about, you know, uh, uh, connected vehicles, right? And, and we talked about autonomous vehicles and the way I see it, that it, it all leads into, uh, leads into an informed driver, right? And we need to make sure that that information gets to regardless of the technology and everyone has the same information so there's no discrepancies between one or the other. So uh, that's, that's to me again, unfolding that potential is, is the goal that I'm trying to push over the next couple of years. Yeah, I want to agree with everything that Carlos has said, and it's really for us also about just standardization of the information so that it's not, you know, one company heard this, another company heard this. Uh, it's really being able to get all that information out to everyone quickly um, in a way that will be helpful and beneficial. And so right now, it's again, it's still very small scale when this fire happened. You know, we had to geofence the area from scooter activity, but, and so I, you know, I got the call on Saturday, and, you know, we, we were able to do all of that. But it's gonna be more than that. It's gonna be, you know, all the things that Carlos has mentioned in order to really, really be an effective tool. And I mean, I'll, I'll also add that, I mean, my favorite is when uh, my digital tools are giving me the wrong information, which happens all the time, right? Uh, turn here, I can't. Uh, it's, it's a school zone. There, I'm on the freeway, right? Um, et cetera, et cetera. There's just any number, or it's sent, you know, you're sent to places where that weren't designed to, you know, for example, you know, support that level of traffic or, or whatnot. So I do think that this idea, right, that uh, there needs to be that more open communication um, is actually going to make uh, the tools uh, that the private sector is trying to deploy a lot more accurate. Because right now, what is considered real time oftentimes isn't. It just isn't right, accurate. Uh, I know we had a couple of other questions. Uh, maybe we'll take this one uh, uh, down here. And then we've got, oh, we've got somebody with a mic already. OK, we'll try to get to both of these that we got down here, too. All right, uh, I'll try to be quick. quick. Uh, my name is Laulu Adirola. I'm with Lincoln Services. Uh, I'm a consultant, so this might be a, a little self-serving. But I'm curious around what, what sort of approach approaches you all use, because I, I bet it'll be different between public and uh, private sector around 
risk management, right? So inevitably, a lot of you have mentioned it's a trial and error, things are gonna go wrong, we have to grow with the system. So, uh, I mean, traditionally, right, big tech is all about fail fast and often, right, versus policy and, 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 and the policymakers are, are more around the slow and careful approach, which I think both are prudent, but at some point, right, you have to bridge those gaps, right? You, we see what's happening with, with, uh, with autonomous driving, we've seen what, what, what could happen with urban air mobility, right? These are all situations that we all know are, re are real, but do, we, do you take active steps to coordinate, right, to make sure that when these things inevitably happen, the communication is quick, right? The, the resolution comes, comes transparently and, and, and so forth. <laughs> okay, um, so in aviation, safety is always first. Uh, if it's not safe, you don't take off. Um, if that if the aircraft is unsafe, you don't take off. Um, and then to support that the safe operations, you have um, proactive strategic dissemination of data like weather, um, and then you also have the um, playbooks in place. So, for example, if you know you're flying between LAX and I don't know Pasadena, and there's a mechanical problem, there would be a playbook in, in place to, so that the operator or the pilot knows exactly what to do. Um, there will always be that um, plan B. Um, so that would also be in the data place so that I, I would hope that one day that, that data would also be able to tell me in real time um, you know, the status of that alternative landing spot. So from an aviation perspective, um, redundancies are built in constantly in the procedures as well as um, in how that data is used and um, we're, we're now trying to take it down to the ground level and integrate that with um, the availability of data so that, you know, if there is an incident that the city will know that there's something going on and maybe they can deploy more buses or trains to try and alleviate traffic in that region. Anyone else? No, no, I, and I think the, the, the question about the risk and how we introduce all these new data policies and how to use their, their space, you know, there's going to be a full transition, right, and a full learning curve through all this. And I think that, that right now it is you start with a strong foundation of the current rules that we have in place. And we're building on top of that, right? So we're, we're not basically saying you, this car can go higher at a higher speed limit than the current one. Actually, we're saying can we go lower and how we manage that on the certain spaces, right? So I think it's, it's gonna be a combination of the, the current rules uh, and build on top of that and, ex and start experiencing what are those benefits it will bring. And as we go into a more mature state, uh, I see the, the potential for it to start doing transition, but that's gonna be years down. One. Um, Amir Sadati with uh, IPS Group. Uh, thank you for ruining uh, the dating life. I don't think I'll ever be able to date the same without having this concept in my head. But <laughs> um, my question is obviously with a lot of a great conversation here, how, does, how do you look at the enforcement um, opportunity as policymakers and rules and policy and data can do all of that? But at the end of the day, if cars are parking on bike lanes and uh, Ubers are triple uh, parking and you know creating unsafe situations. How do cities and government agencies kind of look at that enforcement? Is enforcement as part of the table when you guys are doing all of this um, specifications? So I'd just like to hear your thoughts on that. So uh, enforcement is a part of the calculus. Um, oftentimes, you know, when we want to you know, get started and you want to begin testing, you're not necessarily enforcing right away. You want some baseline, of course. You always want a baseline of rules, such as like what Carlos mentioned. We have a speed limit. We need you to go lower than that. And so you want to be able to do those things. The tricky thing, I think, about enforcement is developing tools that will allow you to manage it on a grander scale. Because the old way is, okay, well, let's hire some investigators. Let's hire more traffic officers or whatever it is and then put them out there and I think you actually need a, a better digital way to do that. Um, those tools are I think are still being created. I, I know that there's people here who probably do those things you know like the ride reports or the blue systems of the world they've worked out those some of, some of those things. I think it's still a work in progress but from our perspective you know when you're making a rule and you're making a policy you do want to have teeth behind it because it's not just something you're making in a vacuum that you don't expect anyone to follow. You really are making it and you, the, the trick is how do we do it? And right now I think it's still in the middle ground of digitally and 
personnel. And then you're on point, right? So I think to, to, to that is you're going to be smarter in the way to enforce, right? You're going to be informed in how, where and, and when you do these things, right? We talked about the data that comes from, from MDS and CDS, and we talked about also, you know, our partners in automotive is probably around too, you know, having able to have cameras and artificial intelligence that can help us understand some of these characteristics then fit into our system through through the, the specification. And then we can deploy smarter because right now what we do is uh, give you the car, give you the keys, go have fun, right? And we have 2,000 square miles of space and how we can become effective if we don't know where to go. If you have this information, then you can start being more targeted uh, in order to address those issues. And over time, you know, you're going to start seeing more of a, a better kind of approach uh, and behavior. Great. Um, so I know that there might have been more questions, but it looks like we're out of time. And I think we've got another panel coming up. So hopefully uh, some of these folks maybe might be able to answer some questions um, for you all uh, offline. There's lots of opportunities to network uh, and connect. Um, for now, I think we can say that uh, you know, we are still very much interested in keeping our dating apps open. Um, we, uh, we, might, we are actually interested in continuing to perhaps, you know, grab those coffees and dinners. Um, we're not ready to take anyone home yet. Uh, so um, we'll continue and, uh, to work on that. But it doesn't look like we need, like, therapy or anything. Sounds like we're headed in the right direction. So that's, that's really great. Uh, uh, panel, thank you so much. Uh, this was a great conversation, uh, and thanks everybody for, for listening. All right, thank you, Connie, and give one more round of applause to our panel. Super fun conversation. Jarvis, Ariel, Lisa, Carlos, thanks for spending the time. And all, I gotta, I gotta continue this theme because it's too good. Feel free to, feel free. You know, I don't want to keep you. Feel free. Uh, uh, but uh, so along the lines of of dating. You know, if you are interested in engaging more with the Open Mobility Foundation, feel free to swipe right. If you know you're ready to commit, something that I just learned, you can swipe up. Amazing. So swipe up to, uh, uh, to if, you're, if you're ready to commit and, uh, and join the Open Mobility Foundation. Uh, we'd love to have you as a member. So now with the conclusion of this panel, I brought my prop, my, my prop here to show you that there is coffee available. It's actually out the, uh, the upstairs door there. You can either use this one or feel free to go out the lower uh, exit here and use those, uh, those stairs that you'll find in the lobby. But we now have a 30 minute break. So feel free to uh, grab some coffee, step outside in the beautiful sunshine, enjoy yourself, meet a new friend, and then we're gonna reconvene at uh, 4.15 for another set of great panels. There'll be a conversation here in the main stage and uh, another one over across the way in the workshop room. Thank you all. <laughs>